Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away tonight. The advice to those in southern BC, be ready. If you're in a flood flown area, be prepared to evacuate. The pain and worry as the first of three more storms pounds BC. We're fearful for uh, more losses and uh, of, of land. Plus, cut off, thousands stranded after record rainfall in southwestern Newfoundland. And the pricey cleanup begins in Nova Scotia. Also tonight, Marketplace investigates. Is flooding a concern for, for that area in the house? For that property? No, no, no. It's too far away. What real estate agents are required to disclose and what they're not. Another military shakeup. The Governor General has signed an order terminating uh, Admiral McDonald. What comes next as the government tries to stabilize a crisis in the ranks? and why Black Friday deals could be in short supply. What we don't want is people coming here and seeing empty shelves. This is The National. People in British Columbia are dealing with the one thing tonight they definitely don't need any more of, rain. It's been falling all day and it will come again and again over the next several days. Today, the public safety minister pleaded with people, get ready. I urge all British Columbians to be extremely vigilant. The time to prepare is now. With recovery barely started after the last round of flooding, the fear is more rain could mean more destruction. And if it doesn't come from this storm, there are two more on the way. But for tonight, there is an uneasy watch underway all across the flood zone as people wait to see what this rain does. David Common is in Vancouver tonight. David, where do things stand now? Well, Andrew, 10 p.m. here in Vancouver, and the rain that we've seen through much of the day is beginning to taper off, still falling, but not in the levels that we've seen. And to be fair, the amount of rain falling is not on par with the major flood event of a week and a half ago. Still, it is landing on already saturated ground, landing on terrain that in some cases remains flooded, remains caked in mud. And it is a very difficult situation. As you note, much more rain coming over the next several days. And that is a real problem for people who are here exhausted and still reeling, many of them, from catastrophe. Even as crews wrestle with the damage in Abbotsford, they're trying to shore up defenses because more heavy rains are now bringing new flood watches. As bad as it is here, the images emerging from the interior are catastrophic. Cars embedded in mud, buses moved by the unyielding water, where rivers bulldozed over the terrain until landscapes became permanently altered. Wow. These new maps show the extent of destruction on the Shacken First Nation. The bridge gone, so too is the power, phones, internet. One of the biggest worries, too, is the way that the river has widened. Lenora Starr, one of many who can't go home. This is the lower part of our reserve, and this shows where all the flooding has been happening. Some homes can't be used until the spring, at least. We're fearful for uh, more losses, and uh, it sure has changed our whole territory, our whole uh, backyard. These zucchinis and pumpkins were washed in a couple of kilometers in the big flood more than a week ago. And now with more rain, there are big questions for British Columbia. After dikes failed and roads were washed out, it has a serious reckoning on how it will protect itself in the future. We're working hard on a new BC flood strategy. But there have been warnings for years that BC's flood defenses weren't sufficient. Now a disaster has proven that. While the Trans-Canada Highway reopened a bit more today, other roads like the Coquihalla, a critical link between the lower mainland and the interior, will take much longer. We're reasonably optimistic that enough temporary repairs can, can be completed to allow commercial traffic uh, on the corridor in about two months' time. Of course, the rain is back, hitting saturated ground and already swollen rivers. It's not just that more flooding is possible, but it complicates efforts at cleanup before the weather ices up. And Andrew, you know, as we look at the events of the past 10, 11 days, just consider the burden it has placed on first responders, uh, on those who have faced loss, 
as well as the many volunteers who have brought heavy equipment, a meal, a helping hand, as anything they can to those who are in need. The Prime Minister will have an opportunity to meet some of them tomorrow when he makes his first visit to the flooded region, Abbotsford in particular, meeting with Canadian soldiers, uh, leaders and volunteers who have offered that helping hand over the past couple of days and in fact week and a half he'll have that opportunity justin trudeau tomorrow in abbotsford andrew okay so let's bring in senior meteorologist johanna wagstaff uh, joe this is the first of three storms is the worst of this one mm -hmm. over yet andrew we've got a few more hours of the steady rain across the south coast and it has been steady uh, we've been seeing rain rainfall rates upwards of eight millimeters an hour so I think for the Fraser Valley, uh, we've seen anywhere between 20 and 40 millimeters of rain. Uh, we may see another 5 to 10 millimeters, uh, but luckily things are easy. We see the end of the first storm on the horizon. Uh, in fact, some blue sky possible tomorrow. Yeah, and, and tell us about the two additional storms on the way. A little more concern for storm number two and storm number three. In fact, uh, let me show you what the uh, precipitation forecast looks like. Again, just a couple more millimeters tonight for those affected areas. But getting you through Saturday storm, it looks like rainfall totals may be a little higher. We may be seeing rainfall totals push 80 to 100 millimeters for the Fraser Valley, along with additional snow melt. And then I'm letting this run right through to Wednesday afternoon. That's storm number three. A lot of uncertainty with storm number three, but a lot of concern as well. You can see here all the whites on this map. That is the over 100 millimeter rain. So getting nowhere near the amount of rain and the amount of time that we saw last week, but getting about that much over the course of five days. So there is concern now with response from rivers by the time we hit early next week. Okay, Joe, thanks very much. You're welcome. Let's head to Atlantic Canada now, where the cleanup from the record-breaking rainstorm that hit there continues. You can see the kind of damage that they're dealing with. As Kayla Hounsell explains, it has cut off entire communities and led to some extraordinary moments. As the storm raged, a dramatic rescue for a couple and their dog, surrounded by water. It started coming up six inches at a time to a foot at a time. It was very, very fast, and it was about three feet in an hour. They live off the grid in southwestern Newfoundland. There was no getting out. It was our yurt only. Around the year and beyond, the forest was flooded completely. Uh, we would have had to swim somewhere. The area was hit hard in a soaker of a storm that delivered record rains to Newfoundland and Cape Breton. This is the Trans-Canada Highway near Port of Basque, where ferries arrive from Nova Scotia. Today, the Premier surveyed the damage from above. It's isolated 5,000 people. There's fairly significant-sized craters in the middle of the Trans-Canada Highway, and, and you realize that, th that the crater is more than just a crater. It represents a separation from the people of Port of Basque and some other communities to the rest of the province. Marine Atlantic will now run ferries from here in North Sydney, Nova Scotia, to Argentia, on the other side of Newfoundland. But that trip will take longer, 16 hours instead of the six or seven to Port of Basque. And right now, there are 225 commercial trucks here waiting to go. We're prioritizing loads to try to get the goods that need to get to Newfoundland and Labrador uh, transported as quickly as possible. In Nova Scotia, parts of the Cabot Trail have also been destroyed. Others still pose a perilous problem. From the surface, it appears that there's asphalt intact, but when in fact under there's no substructure to the central line. So it's a very dangerous road. That's also cut off hundreds from their local hospital and making it difficult for nurses to get to work. They had to drive all the way around the trail, like a four hour plus drive with detours along the way in, in, dark, <laughs> in darkness to get to work. There we go. Through it all, there's community spirit. These folks created a pulley system to get food to people in need. Essentials like milk and cheese, and of course, storm chips, an East Coast staple. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Sydney. Now with so many people on two coasts affected by flooding this week, our colleagues at Marketplace are investigating flood insurance. And as Stephen D'Souza found, more and more people aren't covered for the most costly and common kind of natural disaster in this country. If we had repaired in 2018, we would have ripped it out in 2019 and then again and so on and so forth. Back in 2015, the Archulesis thought this was their forever home. Instead, three floods and more than $100,000 in estimated losses. 
They say the home was inspected before they bought, and they were never told the area was a high-risk floodplain. The word flooding never came up. Never came up. No, never. No. Hello? Will the issue come up for us? We pose as home buyers, calling agents selling homes in floodplains. Are there any flooding issues, or is flooding a concern for, for that area in the house? For that property, no, no, no. It's too far away. So it's not, it's not on a floodplain or anything? No, 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 no. Do you know, is there like flooding issues in the area? No, no, it's not close to the water. It looks close, but it's uh, behind, there's a laneway, and there's another property behind. Oh, okay, so is it on like a floodplain or anything? No, no, no. Experts say the challenge is that there is no Canada-wide requirement to disclose future flood risk. There's a requirement to disclose known risks. So the question comes, what is known and what's knowable? He says many don't know they're at risk Hello. because Hello. Canada lacks accurate floodplain maps. In some areas, the maps available online or at municipal offices can be out of date or incomplete. Let's pass the trail a bit. But even knowing you're at risk isn't always enough. Despite not having a major flood, Derek Terakita lost his overland flood insurance. His insurer said his area and climate change means he's now high risk. It's an insurance company. They're trying to protect uh, their money. Somewhere between 6 and 10 percent of Canadians are uninsurable. Could that number grow? Um, as the risk from climate change increases, uh, yes, more Canadians could become uh, uninsurable. The industry wants the federal government to step in to create a national insurance program for those at high risk. The government is studying the idea, but the Insurance Bureau of Canada says any action is likely years away. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Stephen and the team will have much more in their investigation tomorrow night. Tune in at 8 p.m. on CBC Television and CBC Gem, 8.30 in Newfoundland. Well, Canada's environment commissioner is blasting this country's record on fighting climate change. But we can't continue to go from failure to failure. We need action and results, not just more targets and plans. His report found that over the past 30 years, despite promises and targets, emissions actually increased by 20%. He also found Canada is unprepared for climate disasters. However, Natural Resources Minister Jonathan Wilkinson today insisted Canada is on track to meet emission reduction targets set for 2030 and 2050. Well, after months of upheaval in the military's top ranks, today Acting Chief of Defence Staff General Wayne Eyre was named to the job permanently. As Murray Brewster shows us, this is just the latest move from a government trying to lead the troops out of crisis mode. The word acting can now be removed from General Wayne Eyre's title. Today, the Governor General has signed uh, an order uh, terminating General uh, Admiral McDonald in this position. The Chief of Defence Staff is Wayne Eyre, and I look forward to working with him. General Eyre became the top commander in late February when his boss, Admiral Art McDonald, was accused of sexual misconduct. Months of investigation later, military police declined to lay charges, citing a lack of evidence. McDonald campaigned for reinstatement with an open letter to the entire military, describing himself as an engine of culture change. That unprecedented move against General Eyre divided the military and was cited in the revocation order signed today by the Governor General, who said Admiral McDonald no longer has the confidence of the government. It's necessary to execute your duties in this role in a way that is over and above simply acting within the bounds of the law. It's unclear if he'll sue. What is clear, Admiral McDonald's career is at an unceremonious end. He has contacted his successor, General Wayne Eyre, uh, who is now the chief of the defense staff, to inform General Eyre that he will be initiating uh, his request for a voluntary release from the Canadian forces. I think it will stabilize the Canadian army because right now the, most of the leadership of the Canadian army has been acting. This is just the latest change to address instability and the misconduct crisis. Since Anita Anand became the Minister of National Defence last month, all misconduct cases are being handed over to civilian prosecutors. Up next for the government, an apology to survivors, something that would have been difficult to deliver with an acting defense chief. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. 
Canada's top doctor says vaccines for kids as young as six months could be coming soon. Most likely uh, timeline is, you know, optimistically at the beginning of next year. But again, um, it's up to Health Canada to examine all the data. In an interview with Radio Canada, Dr. Tam said she hopes to see some clinical trial data by the end of the year. Now, kids between 5 and 11 started getting the shot this week, and that's important not because that age group makes up a large number of cases, but because these days they make up far more than their fair share. Tashana Reed shows us how this latest push to vaccinate could mark a turning point. Between the hugs Good job, Nolan. and tightly squeezed hands, there's a sense of relief for the parents here. Today feels like our children are going to be a lot safer with, you know, their first doses of vaccine. Nine-year-old Ava is excited to spend more time with family again. You have to keep yourself safe and others safe like your grandparents. <laughs> These shots for kids 5 to 11 come at a critical time. In the past month, more than 13,000 Canadian children between 5 and 11 tested positive for COVID-19. That's 20% of all infections in that time. Lives upended. Disrupting schools has really affected many, many children and many families. We have a lot of mental health problems. We have a lot of kids who were not getting the kind of care that they needed. This week, 10 public schools in Ontario closed due to COVID outbreaks. And in the past two weeks, the province has recorded more than 1,300 school-related infections in students. Across Canada, health officials are managing hundreds of cases in schools. Still, it's not up to kids to see us out of the pandemic, says this expert. If you want to decrease hospitalizations, ICU and deaths, it's always about the adults. And it's always about the older adults, the immune compromised adults, the adults with obesity, hypertension, all of those things. And as we head into the holidays, boosters will play a key role in preventing a fifth wave. A combination of uh, vaccinating children and boosters rolling out for especially the vulnerable means that our healthcare system is not in jeopardy and we might not see further waves. And with each shot here, a shot at hope, this pandemic could turn a corner. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Ontario health authorities say they're tracking the dangerous blastomycosis outbreak in Constance Lake, First Nation. This is a very rare infection. Uh, to have the numbers of cases that have occurred in that community is, is quite startling. The Northern First Nation, which declared a state of emergency on Monday, says three people have died. It is calling for immediate provincial and federal aid to find the source of the outbreak, as well as for treatment and grief counseling. Blastomycosis is a damaging lung infection caused by a fungus. Symptoms can take weeks to appear, meaning people may be infected without even knowing it. We have new details tonight about a significant upcoming meeting between delegates from the Assembly of First Nations and the Pope. Representatives from First Nations from across the country, residential school survivors and youth delegates will meet with the Pope for an hour on December 20th. There will also be Métis and Inuit delegations who will each have separate one-hour meetings. Well, a dramatic arrest was caught on video in northern British Columbia today. The video shows several Mounties surrounding and arresting a suspected gunman in the town of Vanderhoof this afternoon. Earlier, police issued an emergency alert in the community west of Prince George after a man with a long gun allegedly fired shots into the local RCMP detachment. No reports of injuries. Well, it has been a year since India's farmers began an extraordinary protest movement, camping out, taking a stand to demand the repeal of agricultural reforms that threaten their livelihoods. The Prime Minister caved on the demands last week, but our Salima Shivji is there and shows us why the farmers aren't ready to go home just yet. It's been day after day of this. 364 days of prayers before protest. And the routine continues at the camps entrenched around Delhi. A week after they forced India's Prime Minister into a rare retreat, a promise to repeal three controversial farm laws. 
there's still joy from these farmers, mixed with defiance and a keen sense of their political weight. Despite the victory cries, these farmers are so distrustful of the Modi government, they'd rather stay here in these tough conditions until the laws are officially repealed in Parliament. Kabul Singh has been here since day one of the year-long protest in chains, a symbol of how he feels as a farmer with only two acres of land. It's a big victory, he says, but we'll stay put until we get a written guarantee from the government that the minimum price for our crops won't disappear. That same resolve courses through Hardeep Singh's veins. He's been running a community kitchen at the camp through the stifling heat, the pouring rain and the cold winter months. Our movement made a big dent in Modi's popularity overseas, Singh says. The longer we stayed, the worse it got for him. Worse still once the farmers started targeting a key upcoming election in Uttar Pradesh, a state Modi's party needs to hang on to. He's a prime minister that puts politics ahead of absolutely everything. Electoral consideration always from policy considerations. And so a leader who never admits to missteps offered a rare apology last week, sort of. Could call it a half-hearted apology because he apologized for his failure and the failure of his government to make a minority of farmers understand the purity of his intentions. We cannot say and even with the laws soon to be gone, Indian officials say they're not abandoning farm reforms. More communication is required and that will be done and ultimately uh, the agriculture sector needs reforms. That is for sure. It might take convincing. These farmers have learned the power of a highly organized protest with the will to outlast a prime minister. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Delhi. Well, tomorrow is Black Friday, but this year could look a little different. What we don't want is people coming here and seeing empty shelves. Next on The National, why there may be fewer deals for bargain hunters. Parliament is back, and so are the political attacks. Why is the Prime Minister being such a hypocrite? Instead, he's focused on getting exemptions for his, uh, his MPs. At Issue is here with why that tone matters. And a moment of relief in BC when a precious heirloom thought to have been lost in the floods is found. And I just yelled at the top of my lungs, Nikki, I found it. We're back in two. Two, one, let's have a parade! Well, today is Thanksgiving in the United States, and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was back, and so were the crowds. It was severely curtailed by the pandemic last year, reduced to just one city block. Now, Thanksgiving today means Black Friday tomorrow. But this year, those deals may look a little different, and we can blame ongoing supply chain issues for that. Jacqueline Hansen explains why and who might actually stand to gain. Black Friday deal hunters might be in for some disappointment this year. Montreal-based lingerie maker Le Vion Rose is just one of the retailers cutting back on its typical sales. We've been selling at much more regular price as a way to control inventory levels. The retailer designs all of its products in Montreal, but like many Canadian companies of its size, production is done overseas. This year, more than 10% of its holiday collection hasn't arrived. What we don't want is people coming here and seeing empty shelves. Other major retailers from Gap to Nordstrom say they're struggling to keep up with high customer demand amid global supply chain challenges. U.S. data shows compared to two years ago, out-of-stock messages on e-commerce sites have jumped 325 percent. That supply chain isn't a massive factor for us. Um, this entrepreneur sees opportunity to encourage shoppers to buy local. A lot of these vendors are getting their products locally. They're handcrafting them. They're buying in small quantities. When COVID restrictions shut down businesses across his city last year, Abi Khan launched a website to showcase and sell their products and help them survive. As of Black Friday, he's opening a brick and mortar store to do the same. The timing is perfect just with Christmas holiday season around the corner. While some shoppers plan to make buying local a priority again. If we can shop with local businesses, that would be uh, great. We do need to kind of like contribute a little bit more to like our community. 
For others, personal pandemic hardships aren't over yet. And this year in particular, it's a matter of money. The fact is that big box stores like Best Buy, where I got this, are the ones that have the lowest prices. But just how low they'll be depends on how strong companies' supply chains are. For now, Levion Rose is hopeful that stocked shelves over deep discounts will be enough to entice customers. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, hockey leagues across the country are being forced to cancel games because of a shortage of referees. They, they said, you know what, I'm going to stop here. It's not worth it. Ahead tonight, we'll look at what's behind the shortage on the ice and what's being done to fix it. But first, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Andrew, tonight we're going to talk about the debate over the return to a hybrid parliament. Canadians should be asking why the Liberals can gather in Glasgow but are out of sight in Ottawa. The political strategies at play here and how MPs are setting the tone inside the House. Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join all of us to talk about that and more. That's next. Great to see MPs in their seats. Hear, hear. It was a full house for the first week back of Parliament, something we hadn't seen since the start of the pandemic. But one of the first orders of business, a vote over restoring a hybrid model, a move the Liberals and the NDP agreed on. I don't think it's at all acceptable that members of Parliament should have to choose between their health or representing their constituents. But it's a decision the Conservatives and the Bloc Québécois pushed back against. Canadians should be asking why the Liberals can gather in Glasgow but are out of sight in Ottawa. Okay, so what is behind all this debate? How is this uh, sort of setting the tone for the Parliament we are in? It's Thursday, back for the second time this week with that issue. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Andrew, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, Aaron O'Toole made a, you know, a forceful debate over the course of this week and again today that this is about holding the government to account. He gave a list of examples of when uh, the government felt comfortable traveling and, and wondered why they couldn't then show up, all of them, inside the house what, what is this actually about how effective do you think this this strategy is well i don't know how effective as a, a strategy i think he's on the right track in the sense that there's a reason why we have a parliament there's a reason why we have them all meet together in a room there's a reason why every country every democracy has such a thing and that's because there's a certain theater involved in this it matters whether people are present uh, in the chamber in the same way that it matters whether an actor is on the stage with the other actors or simply phoning it in. Uh, you know, Parliament is a kind of theater. It's the way in which we dramatize the events of the day for the viewing public, uh, not to sort of explain to them what's going on, but to get their attention. And to the extent that Parliament is diminished in that regard, and I think having people zoom in is, I don't think anybody can pretend is the same thing as the real thing, in the same way as a Zoom gathering is not the same thing as getting together with your actual friends and family. Um, to the extent that it's diminished in that regard, that, that then it's going to be less uh, of a potent uh, body for holding the government to account, and to that extent, the government's going to be less held to account. Well, well where, is, where is the evidence, though, Althea, that, that it didn't work with the virtual parliament? I mean, do we have examples of, of, of how it broke down, or I don't know, how they weren't able to hold the government to account, or is that just their sense of things? Well, I think... To Andrew's point, it just doesn't make for great visuals. It's a lot harder to land a punch in question period when the minister is reading a reply from Zoom and you can't socialize that clip and rally your supporters the way you would like to when uh, you're relying on Zoom. I mean, there are other reasons that I think are uh, more worthwhile that were put forward by the Conservatives. I do think that, you know, you think about the new class of MPs that just got in, the MPs from 2019, they barely know each other. Mm -hmm. The collegiality that is lacking on Parliament Hill really <laughs> only takes place when people are gathering over drinks or lunch or dinner. And uh, without uh, being there in person, you don't have that. You also don't have MPs um, having the ability to go and ask a minister about something happening in their constituency or raise issues like that. Like, I think those are mm -hmm. strong arguments that the Tories are also putting forward. Mm -hmm. I don't know that um, hybrid hasn't worked. And I think for some people, like we saw Lauren Collins, the uh, NDP MP yeah. from Victoria, who brought her young daughter with her in the chamber saying, you know, she's still breastfeeding. It's really helpful for her to have hybrid parliament. And we know that the Liberals and then NDP have actually been looking at hybrid as 
a possibility for the future that would yeah. allow working mothers, for example, uh, to to use Andrew's point, phone it in. But it's not that they're not working; they're just working from their constituencies. Yeah, or or for to allow for MPs who have to travel a, a long distance, which is the case for people in BC or Yukon, to not have to do that every day of the week or every week, and necessarily. Chantal, what do you think? This is is important that this is an issue that they should be talking about and debating. I'm agnostic. I, I can understand all the points about the in-person thing, but I am sympathetic to the point of the flexibility at this point uh, when the pandemic is not over. For It's not just yeah. the House of Commons and everyone is vaccinated. It's about having to spend hours on planes, trains or whatever to just get there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the flexibility is helpful to someone who has to self-isolate, for instance, and can still participate. But I think the test of this is how the government handles it, because I do think the Conservatives and the Bloc have a point about ministers being on Zoom and not being in the House, when mm -hmm. leaders uh, on the opposition side have been in the House. And I think it has helped embattled ministers to be on Zoom. And a mm. case in yeah. point, I think, would be National Defense Minister Arjit Sajan in the previous parliament, yeah. who uh, got away with a lot more uh, with evasive answers than if he'd had to defend himself in person. So if the government is going to revert back to people sitting in their offices on Zoom, I, this will be a failure. Uh, as opposed yeah. to an experiment that might bring some balance to the issue. But but a version of it where... Say something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Althea. I, yeah, yeah. I just want to flag that not everybody is vaccinated. Like, we know that there's at least two Conservative MPs with medical exemptions. And frankly, while we are seeing them in the chamber with their masks on, like, they're not wearing their masks in their offices. Some of them are yeah. not wearing their masks at yeah. all in caucus. They're not yeah. meeting their masks when they're gathering. Yeah. So there is a, like, to Chantal's point about the pandemic, like, there is still a public health concern here. For sure. Uh, Andrew, yeah. yeah. Just to pick up on Chantal's point about it being particularly important to have ministers in the House. And again, it's because of the physical proximity. And it's not pretty. Uh, when a minister has a bad day in the house, it's basically the equivalent of bear baiting. I mean, it is they are facing the taunts, <laughs> but it, but if they really don't know their file and if they don't have good answers to the question, it really comes out in those kind of settings more so than in any other setting. Uh, you know, when a minister has a bad day in parliament, they have a bad day in parliament, uh, and that's important from a standpoint of accountability. Althea, last point to you. Well, the other part of the drama that unfolds in Parliament Hill is our role as journalists. And yeah. it's a lot harder to do our jobs when the ministers are not in the House or when the witnesses are not actually at, physically at the committee. We can't run yeah. after them and try to get answers. Yeah, they, they're probably not going to bend over backwards for us. But I will admit, I've run into a lot of people on the street already this week. And, and it's much easier to talk to someone that you, when you bump into them than have to get them to return your phone call. OK, uh, we're going to take a short yeah. break if we can. But we'll be back with another round of that issue and a look at the lessons from British Columbia as the country braces for more extreme weather events. The impacts of climate change are here sooner than expected. What that means for the government's climate plans. That's next. If the last year has shown us anything, it's the impacts of climate change are here sooner than expected. And they're devastating. So on adaptation, we have to accelerate our work. Let's combat and get emissions down while also making sure we have adaptation efforts that are underway. If extreme rainfall and flooding is going to be more common, then we need to build the infrastructure so these communities are more resilient. MPs held an emergency debate on Wednesday night to talk about the floods in British Columbia, but also how to prepare and adapt for more extreme weather events uh, like this in the near future. We're seeing uh, things happening, of course, in Atlantic Canada, too. So does this force the government to approach climate change differently, perhaps uh, more urgently? Chantal, Andrew, I'll see back for another round of that issue on this. Chantal, what do you think here? I mean, certainly it's, it's one thing to talk about climate change. It seems to me it's another thing to talk about adaptation and mitigation and trying to figure out how you deal with these extreme weather events. I mean, British Columbia is a good example of, of you know, them sort of abandoning the idea of, of flood mapping. And so this is where you end up. What, what do you think this does to the conversation around climate change? 
I don't think it alters the uh, climate change strategy as we have been talking about it for the past, I don't know, decades. <laughs> um, how do we mitigate our contribution to climate change? But I think it means that uh, it uh, alters the public safety agenda mm. to adapt to climate change rather dramatically mm. uh, because we are not going to be with a climate change strategy going to avoid the effects of climate change as they are now presenting. And that's right. not going to happen. That we, we missed that exit on the highway uh, and there is no going back. So basically it means that uh, we need to look at public safety, infrastructure planning, infrastructure maintenance in a whole different way and probably do it quickly rather than slowly. Andrew, what, what do you think it does to the conversation? I mean, other than create, I guess, a sense of urgency and in some people's lives anyway, a really direct sense of urgency. Yeah, I mean, whether this specific event is specifically attributable to that, I don't think we could say with certainty, sure. but it's certainly plausible to think that we're going to see more events like this. And that's certainly what the scientists are telling us. I'd be as concerned by the message coming out of COP26, which was that uh, the world is really struggling to get on track mm -hmm. uh, to get that to keep it to the 1.5 degree uh, Celsius increase in temperature, uh, which means that not only are we going to have to deal with the kind of adaptation and, and uh, resilience types of issues, but we still have this larger issue of we've got a long way to go still to get the um, uh, emissions down to the levels that are you know that they're recommending, yeah. uh, which means we're going to be seeing pushing for more and more and more measures to try and do that, do that. And I think it makes it all the more incumbent that we think about doing so in the least cost way, because the more urgent and the more um, ambitious we become with that, uh, the more the potential for excess costs uh, weigh in. And that's not just a matter of the economy, though I think that's very important. It's also a matter of effectiveness. If, if, we, if, if we go with lower cost things, particularly carbon pricing, a government that talks all the time about carbon pricing is still only using it for about one third of its emissions reductions and therefore is using much higher cost me measures for the rest of it. To the extent they're doing that, they're not going to be able to do as much in the way of emissions reduction per dollar spent. If, if we had more efficient means, we could get we could either do the same amount of reductions for the same cost mm. for, for less cost or we could do greater amount of reductions for the same cost. So I'd like to see the, the debate turning in the tension of how can we, not just what are our targets, how ambitious our targets are, but how do we get there? And if we had an opposition that was worth its salt, they'd be talking about it in those terms, about more efficient ways of trying to get emissions down, rather than, you know, we've only just got them talking about carbon pricing at all. Yeah, I mean, because now we're in a place where we, this is going to, I mean, the government's given one, $4.1 billion, a million dollars, $4.1 million rather to the, to the port in BC, but this is going to cost many, many millions to help them clean up and, and adjust things. Yeah, billions. That, that's right, Althea. Over to you. Um, well, I guess a few things. Uh, it's going to not just impact uh, public safety, but it's going to impact the budget in the short term to yeah. that point about the billions sure. of dollars. Sure. This is something the Liberals have been talking about, climate adaptation since 2015. Um, and yes, there is a sense of urgency perhaps more than there already was. I don't know if we can really, I feel like every year, well, it's worse than it was the year yeah. before, so yeah. we clearly should be doing things faster. Um, what was interesting to note about the debate, uh, kind of to wrap into Andrew's point there yesterday, was that actually the Conservatives did not want to talk about climate change and the environment. They wanted to talk about adaptability and everybody mm. was on side, but you know, like Ed Fast, uh, who was leading basically the main um, spokesperson for the Conservatives in the debate, was talking about, yes, the climate is changing, but we'll have the conversation about climate change later. Later, mm. Like this is about mm. the weather. Um, and so mm. uh, that I think still speaks to the fact that that is a debate among some uh, within the Conservative Party. And that is a beat, a drum that the, conser that the Liberals are certainly to beat. Yeah. Um, but it was nice to say on a positive note that the tone during that debate was quite positive and it was not the toxicity that we have seen in the House since they've returned. Uh, and Ed Fast is an MP from BC uh, on top of all that. Yeah, as Sean heard. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Uh, One of the, the hardest hit region, basically. Yeah, go ahead. If you're an MP from BC after all that's happened since uh, last spring, you just can't afford to be seen as a climate change denier anymore. Uh, and what that means is that the, 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 the faction that believes climate change is not serious, while it is within the Conservative Party, is shrinking uh, with every day. 
the vast majority of MPs in the House of Commons, and I include in that the Conservatives, know that this is a serious issue and that it will only get worse unless it is addressed. And that's progress if you have to take progress where you can find it. Okay, I gotta leave it there, everybody. Thank you for doing double duty this week. I'll see you here back here next week. Thanks so much. And with that, I will throw things back to Andrew in Toronto. And when we come back, a shortage on the ice putting some hockey games in jeopardy. The push to get more referees back in the game right after the break. But first. That's Gordon Lightfoot rechristening Toronto's storied Massey Hall tonight. Famous for its near-perfect acoustics, the iconic music venue finally reopened after years of extensive renovations. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No one's happier than Blue Rodeo frontman Jim Cuddy. When you get this he and Ian surveyed the progress back in 2019. Truly amazing. And this week, we Cuddy was given a private tour to see the finishing touches. We explore the past, present, and future of this iconic Canadian venue tomorrow night on The National. Welcome back. Last year, the pandemic forced the cancellation of hockey games at all levels. Now, as teams return to the ice, there's something else preventing the puck drop. In leagues across the country, there is a shortage of referees. Allison Northcott explains. In hockey games like these, referees play a crucial role. We have the same passion for it as the players. Killian Martin has been a ref since he was 13, and he stuck with it through COVID lockdowns, cancellations, and restrictions, but many other referees didn't. Going back to the ice, being yelled at by many people, the parents, the coaches, the players, for just a couple of bucks, you know, many, play, uh, many referees just, okay, no. They, they said, you know what, I'm going to stop here, it's not worth it. So many have quit. Hockey Canada says some areas started the season with half as many refs as needed. As the pandemic went on, people made changes to their lives. They moved, they changed jobs, they changed family situations. Players and coaches, they've returned with enthusiasm and intensity, and officials have just not returned at that same level. It means the refs they do have have to work more games. Other times, there are fewer officials on the ice, and in some cases, games have been cancelled. Marc-André Raymond is a head referee in Quebec. His region is making a big recruitment recruitment push and changing game times. We ask it too, uh, the, all the association to move the most possible games during the week because the week is easier to find, you know, everyone is available. Some organizations are covering referees training and recertification costs. Hockey Quebec says it's looking at an awareness campaign to stop referee abuse. All of it aimed at keeping new recruits and bringing experienced referees back. Killian Martin has no plans to quit and sees refereeing as a potential career. I feel good on the ice and I would not exchange that for anything in the world. Hockey Canada just hopes next season things will improve. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. And when we come back, she thought she lost everything in BC's historic floods until... I saw it shining up through the mud. Just a glimmer of hope the moment she found a treasured item next. Imagine for a minute the one thing, the one item you could save if everything else was lost. Well, for one BC woman, this was it, her grandmother's ring. Charlotte Skaronic thought she lost everything when the floodwaters tore through Princeton, BC, until glinting in the mud, she found it, her moment of reconnection is our moment tonight. My girlfriend called me early in the morning the day after the flood and said, if we gear up and find some rubber boots, you and I are gonna be able to go in and find that ring. We met at her house and we geared up in all kinds of rubber and gear. Oh. She led the way down a few blocks of like deep mud. I'm talking like up to our hips at some point. And we got through to my house and we went in and it was just a little overwhelming at first, but we were gonna find it. We knew we were gonna find it. In between an hour to two hours of just trifling through the mud and not even really worrying about anything else, I saw it shining up through the mud. So I just reached down through the mud and I grabbed it 
And I just yelled at the top of my lungs, Nikki, I found it. And I was so happy and I was so excited. I just started crying. I think pretty much my entire life, my grandma had it on her finger. So I'm just so thankful I found it. But I thought for sure my grandma was with me. Oh, well, you know, so often we think of photos, right? As, as being those irreplaceable items that, that are too often tragically lost in these kinds of situations. But imagine the stories, imagine the sentiment behind that ring that she found, that she looked for it so carefully. But it's interesting to think, I mean, what would be that one item that you would want saved? Maybe it's worth thinking about. That's The National for this November 25th. Have a great night.